Well, good evening. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. That's, hold on. Calvary. That's the old church I used to be. Um, Family Bible Baptist. Uh, old Path Baptist Church. Amen. All right. I don't know where I am. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at, but um, I've been up at Old Path. Old Family Bible Baptist. I can't keep it all straight because I say Family Bible Baptist is the work of Old Path Baptist Church. Amen. And um, pray for us up there. Boy, we've been getting, uh, the devil's been working. And um, we got seriously attacked this week, our family, by two people who um, we have, um, because we stood for Christmas and people that we have been helping for years and and just trying to show the love of Christ. And one person we've been trying to, we have been witnessing to and praying for her salvation, our next door neighbor, and the other neighbor on the hill who claims to be a born again Christian, been sitting in a Baptist church for 60 years, basically called us satanic to this lady. And this lady disowned my wife, who was like a daughter to her this week because of Christmas. And she confronted my wife at the, at the doorstep and and um, actually, she talked to the other lady and kept saying, Merry Christmas, and trying to shove a present in, into her face. And um, told my wife that, don't you talk to me about the Bible. I know the Bible. And um, I want to tell you something a little about the church, the Baptist church in the town that I live in. And um, which is funny because this church got attacked, was mentioned in the email that was sent to us this week. And this church was attacked, which is funny because I don't even... But see, this person couldn't understand why we were driving to 90 miles in Northfield, or 75 miles in Northfield, to go to Baptist Church when they had a Baptist Church in town. When this Baptist Church came into our area, it's a very strong Roman Catholic area, Lutheran, a very strong Roman Catholic. Um, the Baptist Church was having a hard time with its people. They were, they were not very nice to them. And, um, and the pastor there, decided to compromise. They had a couple of nuns visit his church. And ever since then, the Catholics have got along fine with them. And that's the church he's sitting in for 60 years, doesn't even understand. And um, so a lady we've spent five years loving and caring for, trying to give her the gospel. And this so-called Christian 88-year-old lady um, turned her against us in one day on Christmas. See, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to get, I'm sorry, preacher, I'm going to go a little bit here. It's been a while. I want to tell you something. God's been working on us up there. And um, I have a burden for souls like I've never had before. And I'm telling you something. I'm telling you, deception is so great. And when, we, when I can talk to my Catholic mom about Christmas, and um, I didn't try to get in with it, but she, you know, she he attacked my holy Roman Catholic Church, and um, and so I gave her the gospel, I gave her the Bible, and she's like, "That's on the Bible." I talked about the first Adam and the second Adam. What what do you mean the second Adam? Okay, now I understand something. See, I'm going to tell you something because I've been doing so much study on Catholicism, and I'm this Sunday. I don't know if I am. But I'm going to preach a sermon called "Rome: The Cup of Devils," yeah. and um. My goal in life is to preach the gospel and to be killed by a Jesuit priest. Amen. I'm, and I'm not kidding you. That's, it would be an honor one day to stand and have one of those filthy, rotten, stinking devils cut my head off. Because I'm, and I'm going to preach, and I'm going to hound them, I don't, and they don't care what they take from me. And I'm going to tell you, because Rome is coming back for you folks. They've never left. And I'm going to tell you, my Catholic mom is going to sit in hell unless she gets saved, and she knows nothing about the Bible. And I told my mom, but we believe in the Scriptures. We just don't. Your Scriptures are just not the Scriptures. And I said, Mom, you believe in the Scriptures? I grew up Catholic. Five-minute little sermonette on one of the Gospels. And maybe once in a while they talked about Paul. And I said, you never once in my entire life, I didn't say it this way, I said it nicer, okay? Did you ever open the Bible to me? Not one time. When I was there, did she ever open the Bible? They don't even know what the Bible is. And I've been on Catholic websites looking, and they're so tricky. 
They can make everything look good because why? They don't have the Bible. And that's where the Reformation came. That's when the Bible got in the hands of the common people. Now, it was already in Baptist people. All those fragments and stuff that they had, the Bible that we have today, those Baptist people died to get it to there. Okay? I'm telling you something. It's about time we get our head out of the sand and understand that Satan rules and they're out there to get us. And that he wants to destroy us and he's coming. But see, we're so stuck thinking about everything and our traditions and looking at everybody, and they're so caught up. Five years, my wife has walked over almost every day and helping this person, and because we don't want to celebrate Christmas anymore, we've been totally ostracized. How ridiculous. But you see, they love the God of this world. And I'm going to tell you something. The deception is great. And there's one thing that's going to keep you from the devil. There's one thing that's going to keep you away, and that's the Word of God. Because there's so much deception, there's so much wickedness, that you don't even know what the truth is anymore. And people don't care about the truth. I've been dealing with it, I'm telling you, they don't care. we got a whole family that's mad at us because we're not going to celebrate Christmas. And, but, and they tell us, what are you, Jehovah Witness? They go, I'm going to celebrate my birth of my Savior. You don't even give out a gospel tract in 20 years, you hypocrite. Don't even tell anybody about the gospel. Sitting in a church as Roman, it's a Baptist church in this town, called Emmaus, I'm sorry, oh, I didn't mean to say that. Emmaus, okay? Sitting there, got contemplated prayer, women having a little wine tasting, and you're going to celebrate Savior. I'm telling you people, they don't know Jesus. They've never been born again. They've never been repentant. His people abide in his word. If his word does not abide in you, he does not abide in you. Right. That's the truth. And I'm telling you, I'm sick of it. And I'm sick of the deception. And we're going to got to preach it. And be glad you got to preach with it. Preaching it. Amen. And we need some more. And I'm telling you, I don't know if we're going to stay up there. We might move. God might move us. I don't know. I don't care. But I'm going to tell you something God told me. He said, Brother Russ, there ain't a lot of people coming. But he says, you can preach sermons. You can put them online. You can tell the truth. You can help some people. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm telling you something. I'm just telling you. It's, playing games is over. People's lives. I got an 84-year-old neighbor who's going to split hell from the pharisaical Christian sitting on the hill doesn't even know what the Bible is. That's right. And that's what it's all about. You see, they're the same ones when you go street preaching that sit up and yell at you, you're not doing it right. They don't know what God's Word is. Amen. They've never been born again. Amen. See, you're fired. Yeah, I'm fired up because I'm tired of seeing people go to hell because of deception and wickedness and everybody sitting around, I'm going to worship a little baby Jesus. Oh, well, I'm going to tell you something. I worship the Jesus that died on that cross and yeah. sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And I'm telling you, that's the one I'm going to worship. And that's the one I'm going to walk in. And I'm not worried about the little baby. And yes, he was the Son of God. And yes, he was born of a virgin. And yes, he is perfect and he's deity and he's Christ. Yeah. Amen. But you know what? One time you heard him preach after Pentecost. Peter said that, the holy child. But then they laid man to the cross in repentance and faith. Because a little child doesn't convict you. It's the one who was beaten and tortured and died on that cross and bled for you, but we forgot about him. Amen. We don't know who he is anymore. I can't even tell who's saved and unsaved anymore. It baffles my mind because they don't want to walk in God's word. God has broke me down, stripped me bare in the last six months. I've been in more tears in the last six months because I've shown how rotten inside I am, how I've not been walking the way I should. And you say, well, you seem better than those of people, not compared to him. Amen. It's nothing but filthy rags. Everybody thinks they're good. Everything thinks they're wonderful. We got all together. We're just, we're okay. No, you're not. You're not okay. Without the Savior, you're going to split hell wide open. And you're not going to make, get out of, get out of that world, folks. The devil 
His kingdom is coming. And Rome is coming. And I'm going to be preaching on it because they're coming. They killed our brothers by the millions. And they're just right now, they've been, and they've been killing people. by they've, All these wars you see, folks, is from Rome. Okay? You've got to understand. But see, you're, you've been this taught, this taught, there's just that nice little pope running around in his dress. My daddy's unsaved, going to hell, but I tell you what, he doesn't want to dress, amen? This is a man. Okay, I'm thinking earring and then a bunch of jewelry on. Come pick, kiss my little pinky ring. There's one person I'm going to bow to, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? I'm telling you, the Bible says every need to bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm going to tell you something, even all those stinking popes who have killed our people by the millions. But you see, nobody wants to talk about that. It's not nice. Because they're all going back to Rome. Right. And when they all go back to Rome, they're going to kill all of us. Yeah. Yeah. You ever read Revelation? You know, that's that book at the end before Jesus comes. Yeah. I didn't mean to get preaching, preacher, but I'm telling you what, it's been a while since I've been before my brethren. Amen. They're going to build that kingdom, protect that kingdom before Christ yeah. goes back. You look, you look on the Pope's flag, okay? He's got two keys. One is... Temporal power of this earth and one is spiritual power. Yep. Okay, that's what they mean. They tell you that what they mean. Yep. See, they believe that they have all temporal power and they have all spiritual power. Yep. But you see, nobody's taught you anything. Any. Nobody wants to talk about it. They want to have a little easy believism. Right. I'm going to tell you something, folks. That is, a, from, that is from the pits of hell. Right. People need to recognize that they need a Savior. Amen. And that's why their lives change. See, I need to, I needed to save. You know something? I've been saved for a long time. The last six months, I needed to get on my knees and be broken. And God's broken me. He's broken preacher. We've talked. He's been breaking us. He's been breaking you in this church, going out and standing for some truth, and you're getting backlash. You know what I'm talking about. But you see, you know what God's doing? See, God is refining us. He's pruning us. Why? Because it's coming. Yeah. Okay? And you can play games. You know, eternity is a long time to be in hell. Right. Right. I want you to think about that when you look at your neighbor over there and you're not praying for him. Yeah. God has really shown me that we have to be in burden for people. Prayer. Yeah. Prayer. My mom is so caught up in deception. There ain't nothing I can say. It's going to have to be. It's going to have to be a miraculous work of the Holy Spirit of God yeah. to break her heart. But right. you see, we think. Let me tell you something, folks. We think we can take a little. We think we can take a little script and talk somebody into Jesus. Are you kidding me? It's God's job. It's his power to work in a man's heart. It's not mine. He's told us to go out and preach and be, live holy and be in a local New Testament church observing the proper ordinances because those are how we show Christ. That's what he commanded. And if none of my relatives want to ever be around me, my neighbors hate me. Yeah, but we love you. Amen, brother. Amen. I'm glad somebody does. Amen. I preached a sermon. A few. I, I didn't tape it or anything. I tape most of my sermons. I'm not worthy to put on anything. But, but um, I preached a sermon. I just got up and I said, we're not, at this church, we're not going to sell Christ. I'm not selling them. Not putting them on the auction block. I'm not saying, come ye all, come here and see the wonderful Jesus sit on the podium. No, I'm not selling Christ. I'm worshiping him. I am glorifying him. I am preaching him. I am uplifting his word in him because he is everything. I'm not selling them to you. I'm not going to sell them cheaply. You see, we've been selling Christ like we're selling some trinkets in the store giving a gospel and selling it like cheap little trinkets from China. That's how we sell them. 
you sell him the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, who's perfect and holy and sinless, and you took all for us, and you sell him like he's some like he's some little cheap trinket in the store. It's ridiculous. It's ungodly. He's not a cheap trinket. He's everything. It's about time we all get over ourselves and start to understand we're nothing but dust and dirt and scum and grime and filth. And he's the God of gods, but he loved us so much that he sent his only son down to die on that cross for us. And that's the gospel and that's the truth. And it's about time we start to live it. All I want up there is just a couple men to come up who want to love the Lord so we can go out and tell people about Christ. Can't even get that right now. I'm not talking about you guys. I'm just talking about some man. I've been praying, but I don't know what God's went. But I'm telling you something. If i got to go halfway across the country and start a church somewhere else and get a couple guys to go and preach, I'll do it. I don't care. I'm, I just want to preach for Jesus Christ. I'm telling you. For the Nate... Trust the Lord, brother. I'm telling you what, it's not going to be easy, and I've learned a lot of things the last six months, and we'll sit down and talk about them, okay? And I, God's been teaching me so much, but I'm going to tell you something. Get in this book, love him, and trust him. And you're going to say, brother, well, have you doubted that six months? Hey, I doubt every day. Because <laughs> I'm a stupid, rotten human who just who doesn't have enough faith to have enough sense to understand that God is in charge, Okay? I'll get going. I can preach all day, man. I'm telling you what. I'm fired up. I, I, I haven't slept for two days, Harley. My heart's been broken. I'm tired of seeing people slip into hell. I'm tired of my Jesus being trampled on like he's just nothing. I'm tired of people just telling me, well, I'm a Christian. And you give them the word of God, and they're like, oh, that, that's just, that was that, that back that time. They don't, they've never been taught anything about God. Let's turn to uh, number 421, everybody stand, stand, sound the battle cry. I think I just did that. Amen. Amen. Um, and I'm good, glad to be here. Man, when I, I just said, I got to get down here. And we, we, our family has never been down here together on a Wednesday night. Think about that in three years. Because I, I usually don't get, yeah, almost four years. <laughs> almost four years, but um, it's good to be down here. I'm telling you. I've heard, been hearing from you people. I've been hearing people how they've just been going out and speaking the truth and, and going through stuff. But I'm telling you what, God's doing something here. Amen. And um, boy, you know, let the Lord work in your life. Don't be so proud. I'm going to tell you something. Preachers talked about this. I'm putting a sermon together. I, I'm going to preach on it. But people go to hell because they're proud. And they won't change for God, do right because they're proud. Because for 60 years they've been sitting in a dead church. On this, on this, 60 years they've been sitting in a dead church. And somebody comes and gives them the truth from the Word of God. And the first thing they say is, You've been saying I've been doing it wrong all my life? Well, duh. Okay, I've done so many things wrong in my life. You, you, we act like the minute we got saved, we were totally sanctified. We knew everything about the Bible. We could recite it inside and out, knew every doctrine and what. All these fancy ecclesiastics and solitarily or whatever, all these thinking terms you get in seminary, I can't even say them, I don't need to. But I'm going to tell you something. You think you got that and you got it all. Come on. You grow. I want, I want you to think about something. Christ is, God is infinite. He's eternal. He's everlasting from everlasting. When we're in heaven, we will never know him. It'll be impossible to ever know him because he is infinite. See, it's hard for us to understand that. See, we will be in eternity for as long as eternity is, which is forever, it never ends. Think of a loop, just goes and goes and goes, okay? And we will learn something about God all the time. You see, we think oh, it's gonna be boring in heaven. No, because we're gonna be behind. Be, see the majesty of who he is. And every day, and there is no day, there's just one day, the Bible says, because he's the light, that light of the world. We will never, ever know the depths of our God. 
So don't think, oh, I, I, nobody taught me that when I was 18 years old. Yeah, so what? No, somebody did. Believe it. Okay, believe it. Amen. Let's sound the battle cry. No, I just lost the page. What number was it again? 421. 421. Amen. Sound the battle cry, see the flow is nigh, rise the standard high for the Lord. Gird your armor on, stand firm every run, rest your cause upon his holy word. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along, onward, forward. Shout aloud, Hosanna, Christ is captain of the mighty throng. Strong to meet the flow, running as we go, while our cause we know must be veil. Shield and banner bright, gleaming in the light, battle for the right we never can fail. Rouse and soldier, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word. Thank you, preacher. Onward, forward, shout, O land, Hosanna. Then of the mighty throne. O the Son of God, on us when we call. Help us one and all by thy grace. When the battle's done and the victory's won, may we wear the crowns before thy face. Rouse and soldiers, rally round the banner. Ready, steady, pass the word along. Onward, forward, shout aloud, Hosanna. Christ is captain of the mighty throne. I think it's our 171. Oh, worship the king. Yes, 171. Oh, worship the king. <clears throat> oh, worship the king. All glorious above and gratefully sing his wonderful love. Our shield and defender, thy ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and gird it with praise. Oh, tell of his might. And sing of his grace, whose robe is a light, whose canopy peace base, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds form, and dark in his path on the wings of the storm. The bountiful care. Tongue can recite, breathe in the air, it shines in the light, it streams from the hills, it descends to the plain, and sweetly distills on the dew and the rain. Frail children of dust, and feeble as frail in thee do we trust nor find thee to fail thy mercies how tender how firm to the end our maker a finder redeemer and friend now you know why we don't have any people in my in our church because of my singing amen Amen. Um, there's a, some interesting doctrine in that one thing. Um, I'm going to show you in the future that God is 
fire. He literally is a Amen. burning fire. Amen. See, they try to make that a similitude. Try to make that say, well, it's just poetic, but it is not. That's right. He's a consuming fire. And I'm going to show you from Scripture, and I'm going to show you why he created the firmament. Because the firmament, God said he is, God said he is a sun and a seal, shield, okay? He said he's a son of righteousness. See, God is a son, literally, God is a burning, consuming fire. Okay? And he created the firmament as a shield to protect us from his fire. Because when he sits in heaven, he sits in all his glory. You see, if God came to this earth and he let his all his glory come out, he would destroy us in a second. That's why he said when he comes, the heavens and the earth will burn. Amen. When he comes, he'll be that consuming fire. Amen. Amen. Give this to your preacher. All right. Strong clip. There you are. Yeah. Amen. All right, you may be seated. God bless you. Yeah, I'm just telling you that uh, Brother Russ gave you all a bonus. And uh, he uh, gave you a bonus sermon. That's... He's been very grieved these last couple of days. The whole family has been. You know, it's it's funny, though. It's not funny. It's just the way the Lord works. But I'll tell you, you think about this, okay? You had planned to come here like a month ago or something, right? That you would do that. See, the Lord knew you were going to need today. He knew you were going to need to be in the body. You're going to be need to be with the saints to encourage you and to edify you. See, God had already had it all worked out for you. Uh, that that you would be encouraged and and that uh, he would take care of you. That's how he takes care of his children. Right. Amen. So that wasn't an accident. Uh, and uh, God had that for you. And uh, Amen. We thank the Lord for for His mercy. But see, you know, I, before I even get started here, just and I don't know. I always say that, but you never know where that's going to go. But hey, if Russ can do it, then I can. All right. But uh, anyway. <laughs> But you, you think about that, the contrast between the body of Christ, which we, we believe is the local New Testament church, amen? We believe that between the body of Christ and the world. Look at the sharp contrast, what you've been, what, what you've been through in the last couple of days, what we go through when we've been out, and then the contrast of the body, the difference in the two, okay? Uh, the difference, you can see it clearly, that there, that there is a, there is a love, and then there is a uh, that fitly joined and compacted together. Amen. Is what the Lord does. No matter if you're working over, you know, in New Richmond, you're still part of this body spiritually. God has, God has brought us together, and you're still part of this body and part of this work. And that's the work that God does, and that goes beyond human understanding. It goes beyond what we can, we can. Um, try to explain to people uh, when, you, when you experience that and you see that. Uh, you know, when, you, when you're out there contending for the faith and living for God and making tough decisions, um, you know, Jesus said it to us over and over again. He said, marvel not if the world hates you. Well, we're marveling. <laughs> okay? We kind of marvel at it. Well, that word marvel means don't stumble, don't stop, don't get stuck. Right? Don't 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 get stuck on that. Don't don't marvel on that if the world don't wonder at that with amazement or or get stuck and fix your gaze upon that so that it distracts you from what God has called you to do. Because marvel not that the world hates you. And he said that it hated him before it hated you, and that's what was gonna happen. And you you really do know that you're on the right path when the world hates you. Now, if the world loves you tonight and millions and billions of people are going to be watching the Pope uh, and, and watching uh, his celebration, okay, uh, the world loves him. Everywhere he goes, he's a rock star. He is, lo he is loved by everybody, okay? Everywhere guys like Rick Warren go, they are loved by everybody, right? Everywhere men like Benny Hinn and other men like that go, they are loved by the world, the world receives them and the world loves them because they're of the world. But we are fastly approaching the time when we will be, uh, we will be persecuted. This is mild, you know, when we think about what's coming. Uh, this is mild compared to what can happen, you know. Um, 
not to lessen it at all, but the persecution that you and I receive is under the restraint of the Holy Ghost still, I believe, that God is restraining evil still. There's some people that debate that. I don't know how you could. Uh, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, then you're going to know the restraint is over, okay? Uh, you're going to know that it's, it's different, okay? Time is different now, okay? Um, but during this time period, we know that God is still restraining evil. He is still holding it back. It hasn't taken its full course. It hasn't ran its... The mystery of iniquity is still held. Uh, it still doesn't have its full, uh, you know, its full force and power like it will have. Because we understand the scripture says that God will... He will give that power. He will allow that to happen. He will give that power. The Antichrist isn't going to come on his own and, and take, and, and, he, and, and Satan isn't going to be able to have that power. The only reason why he has it is because God allows it, because he pulls his restraint back. He says, there's no more restraint. I'm going to let you, you're, you're, you just give him over. And then that's when the, 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 the deception, the delusion is coming. But aren't we seeing that now? Aren't we seeing delusion now? When you can't have a simple conversation about something that you disagree on, and it turns into a war over or something. I see it all online. I see it everywhere like that. I mean, just try to have a conversation about something and challenge the traditions of men and watch what happens. I mean, you're, you're demonized completely. There's obviously something wrong with you then. Right. Right. Well, and that's and we're going to talk about that actually tonight here. And I'm going to explain some things too a little bit. I'm not going to go like extremely in depth because all the other sermons that I've preached and that really covers that. Okay. I mean, I I think I've covered that uh, point by point mostly. And then if you didn't if you didn't get Nate's uh, uh, booklet that he put together, uh, we are going to put that. We need to get that in a booklet form so we can hand that out to people and they, if they have questions. Or we can send that out with DVDs and things like and CDs. We'll, we'll do that. We'll send some of those out. We just have to figure out how we're going to do that. But that's a good booklet to, to put out there. Brother Ickes has some good quotes in that booklet, too, that Nate quotes him on and, uh, and everything. So we praise the Lord for that. But we're going to use that uh, to try to help others, too, to see, see some things. But just understand that it's not, it should not surprise us when we start taking the hard stands for the Lord that people don't like it. I mean, they, they're, not gonna, they're not supposed to, okay? And every church is going to be different too. I mean, they, you know, there's going to be other churches and they're not going to agree with us and they don't have to agree with us. See, that's the beauty about the local church. We can do what God's called us to do and follow the scriptures and if somebody else doesn't like it, it really doesn't matter. Amen? It really doesn't matter if somebody else likes it or not. It matters if Christ likes it. It matters if it's biblical. It doesn't matter if, if uh, you know, we have, in America, pulpits have lost the ability, the pastors behind pulpits have lost the ability to be able to, or the, the spiritual strength, so to speak, and courage to be able to defy those that are their brethren, in, in some cases, to stand for the Lord. They've kind of lost that ability to do that. They don't want to do that. And uh, it's a problem. When I, you know, I, I've just, I mean, this week has been so busy. It has been, I mean, online, I have been, I've had emails and every, I mean, it's been a busy week for emails and stuff. People have been just sending them in and, and uh, sending, I, I had a few people send cards and things like that this week and, and just thanking the Lord for the ministry here. And um, they want to be a blessing to us, and they have been. It's amazing to see that, really, because we don't ask for anything from anybody, you know, except the Lord, amen, who, who we're supposed to ask. But people send money in from all over the world, and literally all over the world, and it's pretty exciting to see the Lord do that. Um, but anyway, I, I've gotten a lot of emails from people. And they're praising the Lord for, for the boldness that they hear from, from this ministry. Because they say that it helps them. It encourages them. It encourages them to take a stand where they're at. And that they, you know, that they can do what's right. And I'm not talking about just things like Christmas or things. I'm talking about everything. Okay? Just, just everything. That, that we, because 
from what I'm hearing from, from many people that go to Fundamental Baptist churches, they're not hearing anything like this. They don't hear it. They never hear things like this. And, you know, that's, it's a problem today because nobody wants to fight. Everybody wants everybody to love them and get along with them and nobody be upset with them. Well, I want the Lord not to be upset with me. If you're upset with me because the Lord is pleased with me, I'm okay with that. Really, it doesn't even cause me to blink. I don't, I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't even, you know, think twice about it most of the time. Now, if one of you have a problem, then we need to talk, amen? Because that's a different story. This is the body that the Lord has put us all in, so we need to talk about it. But, you know something, I really, when the outside world or somebody else has a problem with it, I, it really doesn't bother me that much. Now, if you have a problem with it, too, and it's truth, then you just, you'll just have to get right with God, just like me, amen? <laughs> But we, we have to, we are just, what you're seeing, and by the way, I want to tell you something as a pastor, I'm very encouraged this, this last couple weeks. And, and by the way, I'm kind of surprised. Um, not that I didn't think you all had it in you or anything, but, <laughs> but I, when I started this two years ago, and speaking out about this, and explaining this, and teaching this, I didn't exactly have the sweetest looks from you all. I mean, I don't, I, I, you know, I can rewind the tape, and I, I know because I've pastored you for a long time here, for a while anyway, for seven years, some of you for seven years, and others for, for a few years, four years, I think, Brother Bicey. So, I mean, I, I didn't have the sweetest looks. I didn't exactly feel the love, uh, you know, that uh, I kind of felt like you, do, you did when, you, when the people were mad at you, like you, when you told them this week. That's kind of how I felt two years ago. I mean, I felt like I was just like racing out the side door on that service because it was very uncomfortable, you know, uh, to do that. I mean, the first time I introduced it, I backed off and stopped because it was too close. And I thought, man, this is just going to beat people over the head and they're just going to think I'm doing it, you know, just to make a miserable. <laughs> and there was a comment that they thought I was doing it to make a miserable. So you remember that, Lee? Okay, yeah. So I just, I backed off and I, I sought out the Lord and I prayed about it and I just let it go. I said, we're going to pick it back up again in six months though, and I'm going to deal with it. And I did. And then it was better received. And then I, I, you taught, I taught through it. And then in stages, the Lord is, has, but I, you know, it's funny because I've never said, you can't do this or you can't, or you can't do this. All I do is present the truth and whatever you do with it is up to you. You know, I, I can't, I, I don't try to control that. I let the Lord deal with that. And over the last couple of years, I've seen some things, and, and this year especially, it was something that, and I didn't really, I didn't mention it to any one person or whatever direction, but the Lord had been dealing with you all about it in different things. And then I, I would have one person call me up and tell me, oh, I got to go talk to my family. I'm like, okay, well, I'll be praying for you. And, and, and you know, I, I, uh, I hope, uh, you know, it works out well and everything. And then another person would call me, then another person. Would, and it's like for the last three weeks, everybody has been calling me at different times and telling me that they are dealing, you know, with this same issue. And, and I just, it shows you that if you will stand for the truth, that God will bless it. And God will use it to speak to the hearts of his people. You know, it's not something that you can force or something that you can demand out of people. It's something that the Lord will deal with them about. And you've got to have patience to deal with it and just wait and give it some time. And, um, you know, that's what I've seen. And I've seen the Lord work on hearts and the Lord bless. And, and I'm encouraged by that to see that. Because we've had a busy year this year, no doubt. And the last couple of months have been even busier, uh, you know, with the work that God has called Brother Russ to do in ordaining him and, and his family and sending them out to do that work. And, you know, with, with Brother Aaron coming, with the picking up the audio, video, the video ministry and everything like that, and just the overall, you know, duties that we have here that, that we're doing. Um, thousands of people that, are, that have been influenced by the ministry. Amen? And uh, it's, it's a blessing to see what the Lord is doing. But we just gotta we just gotta trust him through all this and, and see that it's God doing it and not be surprised when people don't like it. Yep. 
Oh, you mean that the Muslim man? You know, I, or the ex-Muslim man. I don't know. Aaron is kind of still vetting him, I think, and seeing if he's legitimate in, in what he's... Yeah. Did you? Yeah, did you? Okay. 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 Well, yeah, it could be. I mean, I don't, you know. Yeah, I don't know anybody in Syria. I don't think. Yeah, you never know. I mean, I don't, I don't, without seeing somebody, I don't know, uh, or talking to him really a lot or anything like that. So, well, you know, you just, you just pray for that man, whether he, if he's true or if he's real, uh, that the Lord will show that and, and he'll provide that information that he needs over there for that. Uh, it's interesting. Um, another man contacted us from Africa. Uh, he emailed me and had some questions and some things like that. But it's just amazing to see all these people contact us all over the world. It's pretty, it's pretty nice to see the Lord, uh, you know, work in their hearts. Oh, one man emailed me, and then we'll get to the message here. One man, one man emailed me yesterday, young man. He wants, he wants me to, he asked me if I would call him this next week. And I said, sure, or he could call me or whatever. And I gave him my number, but, um, he, he listens to our sermons and then he goes to the he goes to the prison and he teaches the men. And he said he's been using our messages and our information to go there and teach those men. You know what he said he found? He said, I find, he goes, your messages on, on real Bible faith and, and, and repentance and being saved and being born again, he's, and against the one, two, three, repeat after me stuff, he said, he said, I found that most of these prisoners all say they're saved. They all say they said a prayer when they were like five years old. No fruit, no power. No, so he said he's working with them. Some of them may very well be saved, you know what I mean? But he's working with them and he's teaching them and uh, trying to help them. But he's using our materials to do it. And he just, he wants to, he wants to call and, and, uh, and talk for a little while. So I told him we'd sure do that with him. But you just pray for all these people. And listen, pray for Brother Lewis Cole over in England. Um. He is just not doing well. He had a stroke. This is a brother that supported our ministry and sent us uh, money and everything, and and also a good friend. And and you know he really wanted to be a part of the radio show and and uh, you know and everything that we're we're gonna that we are doing now. Actually, uh, we should be recording another one tomorrow. Actually, so. But uh, anyway, uh, he he had a stroke, and he's taking care of his mother, and he's just really bad. I mean, his voice is back. He's got his voice back, but he, I mean, he walks with a limp. He can barely see. I mean, it's just, it's really bad. Uh, so just please pray for him, Lewis Cole, that, that I haven't talked to him in three months because he can't really talk that much, you know? So, uh, and he's so wore out by the time he gets done with it. But just, he's a, he's a good guy though. He loves the Lord. And, and the best part about him was when he was, when he made fun of Nate, that was the funnest part of, um, it was really fun to listen to, a guy with a British accent make fun of Nate. It was really, um, it was good, Nate. It was, yeah, it was good. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I mean, he's been, Brother Anthony's been sick. Pray for him. He's, he caught a bug or something, and then, he, and then he had to go to work, and he's probably, I'm guessing he's just wore down, you know, trying to keep up with everything, because he could only miss like one day or something. And then, because if you miss two days in 90 days from McLean there, he said that you're gone. In the first 90 days, they'll just, you know. So even with a doctor's note, I don't know, you know what I mean? So anyway, so yeah, he, but I've talked to him a couple times this week. He called me and I talked to him for about an hour and, and everything. So he's, you know, doing as best he can do. Okay, uh, why don't you turn your Bibles to Second Peter chapter 1. And... Uh, you know, I'm going to start this by explaining just it it's it kind of meets the the scenario of what's been going on with all of you with your families and everything and dealing with this. And I I want to preface this by saying a few things I have before, but I, I want to reiterate this, okay? When we teach on things that this this sermon is called Christmas a cunningly a cunning cunningly devised Catholic fable. 
mixed with tradition. It's a long title, brother, and I'm surprised you got it. But listen, I, I, I want you to understand something. <laughs> and this, this is where people kind of get messed up. The Bible is, is not, did, Jesus did, or Jeremiah did not say that, they, that these people were heathens that were following wrong customs. He said they were learning the way of the heathen. Do you understand that? There's a difference. There's a difference in calling somebody a pagan and saying, well, you're a pagan because you, you, know, you have Christmas or whatever. There's a difference in that and saying that, no, you're following the way. And that's what the warning was to the saints of God. Don't you get it? I mean, I, I, want you, I'm, I, I want you to understand this. The, nobody is saying that, well, everybody's lost that celebrates Christmas. That's, that'd be a stupid statement to make, okay? That'd be a very foolish statement to make. And it's not one that I would make. Now, there might be somebody out there that might make that statement, and they might not like it that I don't make it, but, you know, I don't care. So the, 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 the point is, is that I, that's not what, what we're trying to say here, okay? I want you to understand that isn't what we're trying to say. What we're trying to do is warn you and show you the truth, okay? That's what we're trying to do. But what I want to, so the reason why I preface that first is to say that, you know what, I have family members, I have other Christian brethren, and I believe they are wrong on this. Do I believe they're saved? Absolutely. Do I believe, that, do I believe they don't understand this issue? Yes, that's what I believe. Um, and I believe they're wrong, and I believe they need to get it right. But I don't believe that they're pagans. I don't believe they're lost for that reason, okay? Because they, they do something that I don't do. All right? I, I want you to understand. I'm telling you that because... Sometimes this conversation, when you try to have it, that's the only thing that they hear in their minds is, well, you're just calling us all pagans. No, I'm not calling you pagan. <laughs> and neither was Jeremiah calling them pagans or heathens. He was saying, you're learning the way of the heathen. So he's warning them, don't follow the way of the heathen. Don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't do that. He's not saying they are. It's a warning to the people of God. It's a warning. You know, this Bible is written to the saints of God. It is written for them and for their edification to try to teach them and admonish them to do right and to instruct them in righteousness. Did you know that? It's not just to, to correct you, but it's to instruct you in righteousness. But you know what I find? Most Christians today do not want instructions in righteousness. It makes them angry when they get instructions for righteousness. Right, because then you're faced with a decision. When Bible is preached, then you are faced with a decision. Either you ignore it, act like you didn't hear it, or you rebel and get angry against it. And hey, we've all been there. We've all been there. I'll get, I'll, let, me get, let me give you an example. Last night I was having a conversation with Nate. And uh, uh, just through... through uh, Facebook, we were, we were talking. We were talking bad about Russ. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing. <laughs> just kidding, Russ. I figured I might as well pile on since everybody else was this week, brother. <laughs> no, we were having a conversation. And, he, and he, he, you know, he mentioned the situation with street preaching. You know, actually, we were talking about a Bible verse about uh, loving your enemies, basically, right, and praying for your enemies. And he mentioned something. He said, well, you know, I, I'm studying this verse, and I, and I really, I'm thinking about this lady downtown that is always withstanding us and standing against us and preaching. I said, sure. And we're talking about, you know, give water, and it says give food. I go, what do you want, to give her a bottle of water or something? I mean, you want, you want to give her a sandwich? I mean, oh, Brother Paul, may he He'll bring some sandwiches. He'll give her a sandwich. He goes, no, I'm not talking about that. I was like, oh, okay. Well, what are you talking about that? He goes, well, I mean, we should pray for our enemies, right? We should pray for them, and we should pray for enemies. And I was like, well, before, I, I mean, I kind of wanted to reach to the phone and just kind of slap him a little bit, just say, knock it off. Who do you think you are? Be quiet. Go sit down. But, uh, um, but you know what? As I was thinking, and I said, you know, I, I, I mean, we've prayed for her corporately before in this church. We have done that. We've prayed against that. But you know what? Personally, I've not prayed a lot for her. And I never really felt inclined to. And I thought about it. And, and, he, and he said, well, you know, that's not a good thing. We should be praying. We should probably be praying for her. I thought, well, why don't you just be quiet? Why don't you just leave me alone? Who do you think you are? It wasn't my idea, so it's not a good one. I'm done talking to you. I put my t I put my my Facebook messenger on block. I'm not here. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't. 
I got. I thought about it though. I thought, well, you know what? I mean, I'm not against praying for it, but I've never really thought about that good idea. So you know what? We all need to start praying for her. You know what? But I could have said, no, nah, you're wrong. Or I could have. I could have. You know, my your pride can get in there, and you can try to stop that. You know, in your mind, you know, because it's easy to get proud about things like that. It's not, and it's not even as much as pride as it is. Man, you've just been through so much, and your heart, and you're human, and you think in the flesh. It's like I don't want to pray for her. That's not what I want. I want to do what those apostles did and call down fire from heaven on there. That's what, you know, that's the flesh, though. That's not the spirit. That's not God's spirit, is it? So the Lord used that in my life to say, well, hey, listen, you can either get proud about this or you can just get right about it. You can just say, that's a good idea. That's a scriptural plan, and we need to put it into practice. Amen? You see how that works? That guy loves me. He does? Okay. Well, I'll pray for him. We better pray for him, too. <laughs> Add him to the list, Nate. We have a lot of people that hate us, Nate. You just... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not in my face. He actually got in Russ's, I think, in Brother Ickes' face. And Brother Ickes the whole time was like stone cold face. I love that video. Anyway, but um, so pray for these people. I love the video because Eric was hilarious, man. He's following around. and <laughs> I'm sorry. Watch the video again. It's great. I'm going to go and watch it again. But uh, I've watched it for a long time. I'm going to go and watch it again. It's a good video. I will. I pray. That's how I remember to pray for him. That's right. Amen. But anyway, but you know what? We got to pray for folks like that. We got to pray for those that, that hate us or despitefully use us or, you know, that, 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 have envy against us. But you know what? We can get, I could get proud about that. And the flesh wanted to say, well, psh, nah, <laughs> no way. You know, I couldn't come up with any verse to oppose what he said. So I just got mad at him. You know, then I had to get right with God be like, well, well, I didn't really get mad at him. Like I didn't like punch him through the phone or anything, but I, you know, I was like, I was like, well, that was a surprise. I wasn't expecting that. I'm not answering that chat anymore from him. But anyway, no, but he's right. You know what I mean? And the Lord showed him that. Now we can either, what, what can we do? We can either deny that or we can say, you know what? We've been failing in that area. Let's get that right. Let's take care of that. Let's make sure, because we want the power of God and we want her to be saved. We want her life to be changed. Then she won't oppose us. She'll help us. Amen? That's what happens. So we, we need to, we, that's the beauty about getting right with God and saying, you know what? That's a good idea. Let's do that. Now I could have just said, well, we didn't have it. So never mind, Nate. Well, you've just only been here for like two weeks. Why don't you just be quiet, all right? Go to the head once you get in the membership. Yeah, yeah. What happened? I mean, Russ shows up and he just preaches a 35-minute message right there. It's like, okay, great. It's a good thing there's nobody working tonight, so we're here all night. So it doesn't, you know. But um, just kidding. <laughs> Just, just kidding. All right, Second Peter. We'll get it. But anyway, that was a good example. So understand, we're not calling everybody. Also, we're not calling everybody pagans and saying, you know, you're, every Christian's a pagan because they're doing this. All right, we're trying to inform and instruct and teach. Amen. That's what we're trying to do. All right, so Second Peter chapter one verse number sixteen. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. You know, the Bible says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and at his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Look at this. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What does it say in verse number four? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Well, that verse is interesting. Uh, those verses are interesting when, it's, when it comes to fables and understanding. We're, we're going to kind of break those, those words down here, and I'm going to try to move as fast as I can. Obviously, I can't cover the whole spectrum of, of the, the, you know, I go back and listen to that, you know, five things you, might, you need to know about Christmas. You can go back and listen to that. Brother Russ has a two-hour sermon that he deals with, uh, um, 
you know, the, the issue of Christmas and the truths that are there. Uh, also, uh, there's, other, there's four other sermons on there that, that deal with that online. So we've got plenty of information on that. So I'm just going to, I, I, but I'm, I, this is more for you, okay? I want you to understand and kind of understand why you're getting such a, you know, uh, a pushback. Okay, try to help you to understand why you get such a pushback from this. Um, and I know because I've had, like I said, I've had that pushback. When the Lord revealed to me a couple years ago this was wrong and I had to, like, you know, explain it to you, there was a lot of pushback. Okay, it was there. So I, I kind of, I know what you're going through. Okay, I because I felt it, and I felt it from the saints of God in the assembly, in the church itself. Here, I felt that same pushback, and I still had to deliver that message. I still had to bring that truth, no matter what kind of bad looks I got, no matter how many women were mad at me, because there's a lot of women that were mad at me. And there's a reason for that, too, but we'll get to that. But first, let's define some terms. What does cunningly mean? What does that mean? Artful, with subtlety, fraudulent, shrewd, sly, crafty, astute, designing as a cunning fellow. Crafty. Say, why would you say Christmas? Well, listen to the name first. Why would you say that is a cunningly devised Fable. Well, I'm going to get to that, but let's define the words first. Devise, it means to invent or contrive. Okay? And it's cunning. It's sly. And it's in its sly invention. As a well-crafted fable. Cunning, sly, crafty, invented fable. But listen to this. A feigned story or tale, that's what a fable is, intended to instruct or amuse, a fictitious narration intended to enforce some useful truth or precept. Do you see that? Some useful truth or precept. So then we, we think about those words. Well, what's the useful precept that is being, and the truth that is being taught in a cunningly devised fable? Well, the truth that's trying to be taught or that's told to most people, what most people do, Christians that are born again, they see the good in that fable. And to them, that part is true because it is true that Jesus Christ came. Amen? Nobody's going to deny that. We, we believe in the incarnation of Christ. Amen? We believe that he is fully God and fully man. Amen? We believe that he came, was born of a virgin, lived a perfect sinless life, and died on an old rugged cross. And he was buried, and he rose again the third day. And he ascended up on high, and he led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. Amen? That's right. So we believe that. We don't deny that. We understand that. So the truth is, the truth or the precept that is tried to be taught is that Jesus, that the, Jesus Christ came. Well, see, that's why it's so powerful. That's why the Christmas fable is so powerful. Because it is true. Jesus Christ did come. So that truth. So why do you think the Apostle Paul warned us? What did he say again? Or Peter said, excuse me. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. We are warned all over the scriptures like at least four or five different times about fables. Old wives fables. Right? We are warned about these things. Why? Well, because in a cunningly devised fable, there's some truth that is in there. The Roman Catholic Church is the biggest cunningly devised fable that sits on, the, on seven hills. It is the greatest, biggest cunningly devised fable you could ever find. And it has fooled billions. And this is nothing more than one of their cunningly devised fables. That's what it is. It's theirs. 
And did you know that before 1850, Baptists wouldn't even touch it hardly? They wouldn't even have anything to do with it. Most churches wouldn't even celebrate. They wouldn't talk about it. They, it was just like an everyday thing to them. They were just going to keep on going. Now, they might reference it, but they didn't reference it as they were observing it. They were referencing it in, their, in some of their writings as, hey, this is called Christmas. This is the day that they celebrate. This is the day that, that, that the other churches celebrate. But they remained separate from that. Why? Because it was a badge of Rome and they wanted nothing to do with it because of the grievous persecution they had went through. And they said, we will not shack up with them. We will not yoke up with them in their holidays. We will not be a part of their, their, their blasphemous days. We'll have nothing to do with them because we know where they come from. We know what they're about, so we want nothing to do with them. We're going to stay away from them. Needless to say, though, as we were warned hundreds of years before this, it wasn't until about 300 to 400 A.D. That, that Christmas came on the scene, really, and was used by men like Constantine and others uh, that used it. And, I mean, there's, there's other players in the game. We'll get to a few of them. But anyway, the point is, is that it wasn't a part of any anywhere. The apostles never mentioned it one time. But what happened? They did warn us, though, 300 years before the, the, they came on the scene the Lord warned us. He said, hey, don't fall for any cunningly devised fables. Stick to the scriptures, kid. Don't fall for any of the cunningly devised fables because they're coming. And they're going to mix a little Jesus up. What does Rome do? Mixes a fake Jesus, but they try to make you think it's your Jesus. It's not the same Jesus that's in the King James Bible. Their Jesus is submissive to Mary. And their Jesus is Horus. And it's mixed with a bunch of, with a false deity. Amen. That little baby in the manger with the halo on his head? Uh-uh. It's not my Jesus. Amen. No, 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 no. That long-haired hippie, sodomite-looking man that is on all the movies, and everybody has the picture up on the wall? That ain't Jesus. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's not Jesus. You haven't heard that? Go, go listen to that. The history of that long-haired hippie Jesus. Go listen to that sermon. That'll make for a fun day. Christmas is a cunningly devised fable. That's what it is. Look at what that means again. Well-crafted. Has some truth or precept to it that has tried to push in there with it. I mean, folks, we were warned about it. We were warned about it over and over again. Don't fall for those things. They're traps. Don't fall for them. We were warned. But what did we do? Well, here's the power in this cunningly devised fable. We're going to get to that. Um, Here's the power in it. Well, never mind. Let me do this first. The Bible does not say Jesus was born on December 25th. I want to cover this real quick, okay? Because there is no Bible for that. There's none. There was somebody born on December 25th, <laughs> and there was some that are recognized on December 25th, but it wasn't Jesus Christ. And by the way, if you have to take me to a Catholic text, okay, if you've got to take me to Santa Claus or St. Nick or anybody else, and you want, to, you want my authority for a positive form of worship, not a negative one, okay? Not they killed my brother, and here's the record of it. Not that they hated us because we wouldn't take the communion in the cup of devils that they offered. Not the one that we would not take their wicked, adulterous, idolatry baptism that they tried to push, which wasn't even baptism. Sprinkling's not baptism. There's a record of those things. But if you want me to take a positive form of worship from Rome, that's insane. But I like this note here. This is from Nate's writing here, and also Brother Rick is kind of mixed in there. By the way, the Bible says the church is supposed to be the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. You still believe that, right? So would it be a sin if I propagated a lie and told you that I could prove to you that Jesus was born on December 25th and that he commanded us to observe this worship? Do you know what Matthew chapter 28 says? Turn there. Why don't you turn there real quick? You better believe it. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. You believe that? Amen. Then I hope you believe the rest of it too. Right. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. 
Ooh. Uh, okay. Yeah, his testament written in blood. Okay. He says, teaching them to reserve all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So, you know, I'm not allowed to teach you that you should celebrate the birth of Christ. Because I wasn't told to do that. I was not told to do that. He did not tell me to do that. So, he says here that I'm to teach you whatsoever things I have commanded you. What did he command you? Bapt uh, go ye into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize them, organize them into churches, and the Lord's Supper. Remember me. This do in remembrance of me. How am I to remember him? His death. That's what I was told to remember. Now, we can throw out all the pagan stuff and say, well, I can add it. That's just kind of more fuel for the fire, right? But the truth is, I'm told to observe, teach you whatever he said to observe. What he taught. What he said. What his word commanded. That's what I'm to teach you to observe. Hmm. All right. This is the heart of the Christmas issue. Is Christmas true? Was Jesus born on December 25th? Do we know with any certainty when he was born? If we do know when Jesus was born, or at least if we can know when he wasn't born, should we partake in a blatant lie as, a ch as children of truth? This is what makes this subject of Christmas more than what it's portrayed to be. It is a little bigger than the pagan roots or negative and positive connotations. It is as big as the truth. If we are to separate ourselves by standing for and being about the truth, then what are we do doing aligning ourselves with lies? Who is the father of lies? Then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then Jesus upbraids the Jews with some very harsh words. He said, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. What is the greatest lie ever told? The mystery of iniquity. Amen? If you understand, if you don't understand that, go back and listen. We're actually we're going to have a sermon on the New World Order. We're going to have a radio show tomorrow on the New World Order, and explain to you the birth of the New World Order from the Scriptures, and explain to you all the way through. That radio show is going to cover all the way through the Scriptures on what that is, and set a set. We're going to set a found, lay a foundation there upon Scripture, and then we're going to build upon that with things that are going on, and we're going to teach every aspect of that for a while, and not every, but a lot of it, and we're going to try to help you with some of that to give people a foundation to understand that. But he says, you're of the he says, and because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Jesus clearly points out that an obvious distinction between his disciples and the world is that line drawn by the truth. We must be for the truth. We have to be. You, you have to understand something. The reason why I don't have a problem snorting and screaming and, and, and standing and everything else is because by the grace of God, I understand that your children in this world and as you walk in this world, it is so absolutely confusing all the time. There is never a right. There is never a wrong anymore. There is never the straight and narrow anymore. What is there? There's only a wishy-washy gray area. Nobody wants to preach the hard thing and tell the truth straight down the line. Why? Because then people are going to get offended. Good! It's time to get offended. It's time for you to get right with God and get out of this stinking world. Stop taking their worship. Come on, folks, listen to this. There is going to be billions of people tomorrow that are going to be, they're going to be acting like they really love Jesus Christ. And the Pope is going to be the head of them all, and he's going to stand up there. And he's going to love the fact that all, everybody's celebrating Christmas with him. That just gets me. That bothers me more than any of it. If I never, if that was the only reason why, that would be enough for me not to follow that fish head. 
That would be enough for me because I would not want that goofball scepter in front of me waving it around, acting like he's in charge of billions of people and telling them what they're going to do and, and, and leading them like he's the shepherd of them all. He's an antichrist, yeah, yeah. wicked devil. <clears throat> That's enough for me not to be involved with it. It's enough. <clears throat> But the answer is no, he wasn't born on December 25th. He was born, he wasn't born then, and we can know with all certainty how. Can you say this, you might ask? Well, here's how, okay? The key to knowing when Jesus was born centers in Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. The account of Zacharias and his priestly service is found in the Gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 1, we learn that Zacharias was of the course of Abiah. This is the description of the family that Zacharias is descended from. King David appointed the courses, the turns or orders of the ministration, to ensure that the priestly work was evenly divided so as not to burden one family over another. The Bible says this, Thus were they divided by lot, one sort with another, for the governors of the sanctuary and the governors of the house of God were the sons of Eleazar and the sons of Ithamar. And now, now the first lot came forth, Jehoriah, the second to Jediah, Jediah the seventh to Hekaz, the eighth to Abiah. So that's in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. So he sets the priestly order right there and he explains it. As we have read above, the course of Abiah was the eighth course. This means that Zacharias was following in the footsteps of the sons of Abiah in performing the eighth course. As you also notice, there are 24 courses. Each course consists of one week, twice a year. The courses start in the first month. This principle is outlined in 1 Chronicles chapter 27. So the first course would begin in the first month, first week, and each week the next course would take its turn. There were also three main feasts per year upon which the whole congregation of Israel came to the temple in Jerusalem. These three feasts were the feasts of Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles, found in Leviticus 23. On these three weeks, the whole priesthood would minister in the, in the case of Zechariah. Then, during the eighth course, it would have been the tenth week of the year, because Passover and Pentecost were observed since the first of the year. The Hebrew calendar begins with the first month, Nisan, which is right around the beginning of April. The Hebrew calendar was a lunar calendar and lunar calendar as opposed to a, our current solar calendar. And this explains the difference between the calendars. Anyway, Zacharias is performing the course of Abiah on the 10th week of the Hebrew year, 10 weeks after early April. In Luke, we learn that Zacharias was told that his wife, Elizabeth, would conceive John the Baptist. So after John goes home from his priestly duties... It is late June when Elizabeth conceives. Next, we learn the angel Gabriel visits a virgin named Mary. He tells her that she, should conceive, she would conceive Jesus. Mary was the cousin of Elizabeth, so Mary runs to Elizabeth's house to share the good news. When Mary is given the news of her conception by Gabriel, we learn that Elizabeth is six months pregnant. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. Okay, since Elizabeth conceived in late June, six months later, gets us to late December. See, late December is not irrelevant because this is when Jesus was conceived, but it is not when he was born. Nine months later, Jesus would be born. This is late September, right around the Feast of Tabernacles. Disclaimer, I believe Jesus was born on the, fifth, on the Feast of Tabernacles because Jesus fulfilled so much scripture in his life, died on Passover, went to hell on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and rose on the Feast of First Fruits. Therefore, it makes no sense to me that Jesus would be born at just any meaningless time on the calendar. Is this because Jesus is God, taberna is this because Jesus is God, tabernacling in the flesh, maybe? Nonetheless, Jesus was born in late September. This is corroborated by the fact the shepherds were close by, the fact that Caesar Augustus decided the tax population to tax the population at that time, and this is why Joseph and Mary were traveling to Bethlehem in the first place. Does a king tax people in the wintertime when this is the time when they have less to give in any other time of the year? Does a king require his people to travel in the winter, especially across mountains? That just makes no sense. The best time to tax would be right after the harvest. That would be when? September. David Ickes. Pastor David Ickes. There is more evidence in other, in other reasons if anyone needs it, but this should suffice. So we can conclusively say that Jesus was not born in December, let alone December 25th. That is a lie. It is not the truth. We do know when Jesus was born, so how is it we can line up with a lie again? Aren't we supposed to line up and set ourselves apart from the world by lining up with truth? Amen. Yes, we are. It seems that this is not as important for most Christians, but that, it is not the, but that is not the question. The question is whether or not 
The truth is important to God. And whether we can be pleasing to God by perpetuating a lie. God has told us specific, specifically what type of worship is not only pleasing to Him, but required of saved people. He said this in John chapter 4, verse number 23, But the hour cometh and now is when the true worship, worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is His spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. This alone is enough that you and I should not accept a cunningly devised fable. We should not accept uniformed worship with Rome. We should not accept it. We just shouldn't. No Bible believer should accept uniformed worship with Rome. It, it should not be. We should always seek the truth. Yes, Jesus was born, but not in December. Therefore, the 25th of December, the day that was observed. So who was born in December? And why does Rome have an interest in making, why did Rome have an interest in December 25th being the day that everybody worshipped or sought out the, the baby and, and, and had a birthday party for a baby? The, the baby, Christ Jesus there. Why would they try to change that? Why would they mingle that? Well, listen, listen to this. Therefore, the 25th of December, the day that was observed at Rome as the day when the victorious God reappeared on earth, was held at the Natalis Invicti Solus, the birthday of the unconquered sun, S-U-N. Now the Yule Log is the dead stock of Nimrod, deified as the sun god, but cut down by his enemies. The Christmas tree is Nimrod Redivivus, the slain god come to life again. Hislops to Babylons. Semiramaris, Nimrod's wife and mother, claimed that Nimrod would visit the evergreen tree and leave gifts each year on the anniversary of his birth, which just happened to be on December 25th. Does that bother you at all? Because that bothers me. Amen. It bothers me that I fell for a cunningly devised fable so long. That, that bothers me a little bit. Doesn't that bother you? And for, I mean, I'm glad I got it right with God a long time ago, and it's over. It's done with. Amen? But I'll tell you one thing. It still bothers me. It bothers me when I think about it, though. I think about other, and people don't realize the significance of this. The ancient Babylonian Christmas tree became known as a symbol of fertility throughout the ancient world. They were symbols of fertility. I'm not going to read all of it. But you'll get the point. Male and female, all represented by it. If you want any more information than that, you men can see me afterwards and I'll show you where to find it, but I'm not really going to mention all these details, okay? You can explain those to your family. Also, the wreaths are the branches twisted into circles. Uh, so the branches would be associated with the sun, another representation of the unconquerable sun god, Nimrod. The truth is that December 25th was celebrated as the birthday of scores of pagan gods long before it was ever associated with Jesus. As we discussed earlier, the celebration of December 25th goes all the way back to Nimrod, who eventually came to be worshipped as Baal. Baal worship spread throughout the known world and provided the basis for all other pagan religions. The following are just some of the pagan gods that had birthdays on December 25th. Mithras, Horus, Attis, Dionysus, the son of Zeus, Tammuz, Hercules, Perseus, Helios, Bacchus. Oh, Bacchus. How about that? Well, everybody has a birthday on December 25th, man. Isn't that amazing? All them heathen gods do. Yeah, that's the booze god. That's the wine and revelry god. Apollo, Jupiter, Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun. Now, let me ask you a question. Should that bother us? Should. If we believe in the truth, it should bother us. It should bother us at all these people. You say, well, that's not what it, that's not what it means to me. Well, I'm sorry. This world is not relative, okay? So you don't get to say that doesn't mean that to me. If that's the definition of it, that's what it is. Okay, it's just like somebody says, well, when I have a Christmas tree, I'm, that's not what it means to me. I, I know. I, I understand that, okay? Nobody thinks that you're worshiping a tree, okay? In, in essence, we don't think that you're trying to do that actively, okay? Do you understand that? Like, I, I mean, everybody I know had a Christmas tree for years when I was growing up, and not one of them actively said, well, I'm worshiping this tree, okay? Well, I'm doing this. No, but we're still following the way of the heathen, 
Okay, we're still learning the way of the heathen. You don't have to be a heathen to learn the way of the heathen because God was talking to righteous people and he was telling them, don't learn the way of the heathen. You're not heathens. Stop acting like them and mimicking them because you're not them. Does that make sense? Amen. So nobody's saying you're a heathen. Okay, what we're saying is why, duh, we know you're not heathens. Why are you following them? doesn't mean that to me. I know, but you can't tell God that, okay? Because God already, God already said things that were right and things that were wrong. Okay? I'm not going to go through Jeremiah 10 tonight because I really don't have, I have time for it. But just read it. But I know, but it's not called a Christmas tree there. I, I get that. I, I, I know that. it's Because that name wasn't there yet, okay? But when you're doing the same thing, you, you can't call it something else and say, well, it's not that. Well, yeah, it is. I, like I said before, I have a friend on Facebook that, well, he's, he's actually a personal friend too, obviously, but, but um, and, and he literally, I mean, you, he, there was like four pictures set up and you could see him. He took an ax and he, and he chopped the, the, the tree out of the woods and he, and he drug it and he, and he drug it out of the forest. I'm not kidding you. And he set it up in his house and he fastened it tight and he decked it with gold and silver. And I was like, if I would, if I didn't have, you know, if I didn't feel bad for his wife because I wouldn't do this to make her upset, I would so take those pictures and, and do one of those. And if you put together some of those things, put those verses across it, because it would be like a slideshow of exactly what the Lord said not to do. And say, well, that's not. Now, if, if I read that verse to you and I showed you those pictures, what would you say that was? You would say, well, your deck, I mean, you're taking all the tree you're i mean you're doing everything but you're calling it something else well does that i mean so we could do the same thing and just call it something else and god's okay with it come on come on people you're too smart for that okay <laughs> you don't 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 insult yourself and your lord that much he is giving you more he's giving you more wisdom than that once you see these things only pride keeps you from making the right decision well the, i'm gonna have to say that i did it wrong for years that's all right. Hey, Russ just told you not. He does all everything wrong. So I mean, it's I mean, you feel good about it once you know how bad Russ is. You just look at him and be like, hey, he's always messing up. I'm just kidding. But you know what, brother Russ and I, we had phone calls with each other the last couple months. He said, man, I was doing this wrong. Brother Nate, you've talked to me. I said, man, we've been doing this wrong. I mean, just personal things we gotta get right with God about. Don't you understand there's a liberty there when you can get right with God? When you can, when you can say, hey, that was wrong, but I'm going to do right. Do you understand the liberty that's there with that? How much power that has when you can just say, you know what, I was wrong, but now I'm going to do right. Man. And then you know what happens to you when you do that? You have a revenge against evil. Then you have a revenge, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, you have a revenge against wrongdoing and evil. Not that you're mad at people, but you're mad at the sin and you want to straighten, you want to teach people and show them the truth. Why? Because you've been delivered and you have a revenge against it. But if you hold on to your pride, you'll never grow. There's so many Christians today that never grow because they're too proud to admit they've done wrong. They're just too proud too proud. In the year 350 AD, Pope Julius, hey, Pope Julius, is that like, hey, what, didn't they, didn't they used to have Orange Julius? Poor Pope Orange Julius. Yeah, Pope Orange. Uh, I declared that, the, he, de he says, he said this, he declared that the birth of Jesus would be celebrated on December 25th from then on. Well, hey, since Pope Julius said it, you ought to follow him, right? Because, hey, Pope Julius said it, and he decreed it, and he's the Pope. Is he your Pope? Rick Warren said, well, our new Pope is such a great guy. Who, who's new Pope? I don't have a Pope. Amen. I the pope. That's right. I don't, I don't have one of those. I don't know who that is. But I, I, I mean, I don't have a Pope, Rick. You got a Pope because you're the little Jesuit plant. <laughs> there's a lot more of those, too. We're going to get to gatekeepers sometime soon. But um, there, there's a few of those out there that are religious gatekeepers. Anyway, but, uh, you know, I don't have a pope. Do you? Well, maybe you should. Pope Julius is the one that set that, though. I'm, I'm, I'm just curious. Do you think the Anabaptists that were running around and the Waldenses and, and, and all those other men that were running around trying to keep their heads, 
You think they said, well, hey, since Pope Julius said we got to do this, we better do this. I mean, let's do this. I mean, he said it's December 25th. That's just the way it is. Think about it. Pope Julius, he decreed that, that the birth of Jesus would be celebrated on December 25th from then on. There appears to be a little doubt that Pope Julius was trying to make it as painless as possible for pagan Romans to convert to Catholicism. But see, that's what it was all about. It was a cunningly devised fable. What did he do? He took all those gods, Mithras, and all those other ones, and he just said, well, let's just add Jesus to that list, and we'll put him right on December 25th, and the pagans will worship him, and everybody will be Christian. No, everybody will be Roman Catholic. That's right. Just add a little, what is it? Cunningly devised fable. That's what it is. Cunningly devised. So there's a great power. There is great power with truth mixed with error. We wonder why does it have so much pull? Well, there's 1.1 billion Catholics today that are fooled by, by Roman Catholicism. Why? Because he has truth mixed with error. Truth mixed with fables. Amen? How could so many people believed, believe that that wafer is a charged object and Jesus Christ is trapped in that charged object? See, that's not what they believe. Well, they don't say that, but that's what he is. It's called the host, right? And then what's the juice? That's the, that turns into the blood. That's actually, you're actually, it, transubstantiation. It's actually turning into the blood. It's actually Jesus' body in that wafer, in that, in that host. It's actually him. And, right. 120 million times here. And there's 1.1 billion people or more following that. Right. It's called a delusion. How, how does, how, how do one point, when the Bible says clearly, when people claim to be Christians, and the Bible says very clearly not to bow down to grave, any graven image, and you have billions of Roman Catholics that bow down to graven images, but you know what they do? They do the same thing fundamental Baptists do. Did you know that? What's that, preacher? What are you talking about? Well, fundamental Baptists Baptist practice Roman Catholicism in Christmas, every year, Baptists become Catholics for one month of December, okay? And they, be, they practice the same thing as Rome does. And then when they do that, they call it something different. No, that's not what I'm doing. Well, that's what the Romans say when they bow down to that statue. No, that's not what I'm doing. We don't bow, we don't bow down to those statues. Yes, you do. So if Catholics don't get to do it, neither do Baptists, okay? I know that one gets people upset, but and it should. It should challenge you. It's hard to accept the fact that Baptists who are supposed to follow the Bible as their only rule of faith and practice would fall, would observe error and not the truth. Isn't it hard to I mean when you have a conversation with these with, with people about this, we're gonna get to that. Well, why is it so powerful? Why does it, because it's a coming wise fable, yeah, and it has some truth to it, but also here's the other reason why it's so powerful today and why people won't hear the truth when you try to give it to them. Because this is just simple. The five facts that I preached, that one is a little more in depth than the other sermons have a whole lot that cover all, a lot of this stuff, all right? But they cover every aspect of it. If you really want to go back to some old files, the time that all you were mad at me, go on to oldpastbaptistchurch.org and listen to that sermon that was on there. It's called The Truth About Christmas. <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I don't mean to bring up bad things or anything, but I mean, you can go back and listen to that. And that has everything detailed, very in-depth to everything. But why is it so powerful? Because... It's fables mixed with tradition. It's, yeah, exactly. He, he tells the truth about it too, doesn't he? But this, it's fables mixed with tradition. A lot of people celebrate and observe Christmas because it's tradition. I get it. I don't think they're doing it because they want to be heathens, okay? I get that, okay? I, nobody, we don't claim... 
that we believe that, again, that, that we think they are heathens. No, I believe they're saved people that do it. I believe they're wrong. But Mark chapter 7, verse number 13 says this, Making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Now, he was, he was talking to the Pharisees. Did you know the Pharisees were religious? Kind of like Rome. Very religious. Colossians 2.8 says, Beware. You know what that means, don't you? Beware. You know, you ever been walking, it says, Beware of dog. Right? Well, what does that mean? That means you better be careful, because if you go over there, that dog's probably going to eat you. Okay? Or it says, or I've seen some signs that say, Beware of owner. That guy might eat you too. So don't 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 go don't go or, or shoot you. So don't go into his yard, right? Beware. I'm more scared of the owner than I am the dog, okay? When somebody has that sign, that's crazy. But beware, right? Beware. That means, hey, you better look out. Right? So what did he say here? He says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. Uh oh, this part hurts a little bit. After the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We're to beware. We're told to beware lest any man spoil you through what? Vain philosophies and traditions of men. And see, that's what it comes down to. We have been spoiled somewhat by these things. We have been fooled and tricked by them. And we've just kind of incorporated them into our lives, never asking a question of why we do that. When all that someone does is just says, well, you know, when you grow up, you're just like, well, it's Jesus' birthday on December 25th. Did anybody bother to check that fact out to see if that was true? I mean, I didn't my whole life. I never bothered to check it out. I just knew I was getting presents and people were making fudge and stuff. So, I mean, I, I mean, that's right. I mean, amen. Making fudge. That's right. People are making big turkeys and fudge and mashed potatoes and I'm getting presents. Ever since I started preaching this Christmas thing, I ain't getting no presents anymore. I'm telling you, Brother Ross. I know it. I'm telling you. I'm not doing it for the money, I'll tell you that. Anyway, but, but that's, listen, we're told to beware. Because, I mean, I never asked. Who would ask, right? I mean, does anybody know if Jesus is born on December 25th? I don't know. I never sat around opening up presents. And I mean, let's be honest. Most of the time we don't even think about Jesus. We think about ourselves. Amen. Come on. Let's admit it. We think more about ourselves. How come it's supposed to be his birthday and we get everything? Hey, in honor of Jesus' birthday, I'm going to treat everybody and myself to something. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I was spiritual. <laughs> Great. Man, I'm going to grandma's house and she's making a bunch of food and fudge. So I'm going to eat that, right? That's what, I'm, that's what we're doing. We never bothered to ask about that, right? Why would we? I mean, it was just like, it was just normal. That's what everybody did. So it became, it became family traditions over the years. And people attach a lot of emotions to that. And they, and and they attach the family love and get together and everything that they do together with that. and Because some of it is sincere, okay? Not everybody is doing it just out of formality. A lot of people love that time. They get together with their family, okay? So what am I saying? What I'm saying is, is that that's why it has such a hold. Because you and I remember growing up all the fun that we had and all the things we did together as a family and, and, and everything that the Lord did, right? So then what happens then? Okay? So... We think about it, and we say, well, I, I don't want to damn my past. I mean, I have a lot of good memories back there with all that. I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, de I don't want to destroy all that. I don't want to say that's all wrong. I mean, a lot of great things happen there. But here's what you're missing. What you're missing in it all. And some of you really want to put it away. <laughs> don't want to think about it. Paul's over there like, I'm glad it's done. It's over with. <laughs> I'm just, I'm telling you, Brother Paul, there's some families that did have fun, okay? <laughs> there is, there is some. I know, I know, I know. 
<laughs> we'll talk later, Brother Paul. Okay, Brother Paul, we'll have therapy later, okay? <laughs> I know. And that's what a lot of it is. That is what a lot of it is. But there, is, but there are some families that it was a family get-together. It was a big deal to them. I mean, I've, I, you know, I didn't grow up, like, we didn't have alcohol when I was a kid around like that. I mean, we didn't have a lot of that stuff around or anything like that. But it was a, it was a family get-together. And that's where people equated. But for some reason, you think that if you stopped following wrong practices that you, is there something in the Bible that says you can't get together with your family? Can't you just put aside all that other stuff and get together and love one another? Why do you, why, I mean, in truth, in spirit and in truth, why do I need to follow Rome and do all those things that Rome does and follow those things in order to spend time with my family or do anything? And by the way, do you really need to be prompted by the Pope and Rome and every other custom out there for you to buy something for a family member? To give them a gift and to love them? Why couldn't you take a day in January or a day like this and have a family day and do whatever you wanted to then? Why couldn't you do it then? Well, because everybody will think we're weird. Well, they already think that. I mean, I think you're weird. So what's the big deal? You think I'm weird. I don't care. Hey, Amen. It doesn't bother me. But people can understand, hey, we're not against getting together as family. And we're not against loving one another. And we're not against giving gifts to each other. We're not against any of those things. But we're for worshiping in spirit and in truth. That's what we're for. Right? And some people say, well, I mean, December 25th, everybody has it off and they have time to, well, why can't you just come together and eat some food and fellowship one with another? Is there a sin in getting together on December 25th? No, there's a sin in practicing idolatry and following the way of the heathen. Hey, it just so happens that there's a bunch of people that are off work December 25th, right? Because so we could use it for the Lord still. I mean, we can still honor. We can still honor the Lord every day of our lives. We don't have to practice the customs of that, right? I'm not going to go where they're going to have Christmas trees and all those, and they're going to do all. I'm not going to be trapped into all that because I I believe it's wrong to do that. Because it has. Not, by the way, what's a tree have to do with Jesus besides him dying on an old rugged cross? That was a cross. It wasn't an evergreen tree with lights around it. Amen? Amen? So, I mean, if you want to talk about a tree, let's talk about the cross. Amen? Amen? Right. Cursed is he that hangeth on a tree. Right. That never gets me out of too much, though. The, the other tree gets all the glory, the evergreen tree. I don't have time to get into it. No, it really wouldn't, would it? Wouldn't be, wouldn't be good. But what has happened? Tradition has taken place in American churches more than anything. Fables mixed with tradition. And these fables have become tradition, and they're very powerful. And then you wrap everything up with it. What did Spurgeon say about this? Not that Spurgeon is Jesus Christ or anything, but a, a man of the times that he was in right there, this is what he said. He said, when it can, when it can be proven that the observance of Christmas, Whitsuntide, whatever that is, and other popish festivals, oh, he called it popish was ever instituted by a divine statute, we also will attend to them, but not till then. It is as much our duty to reject the traditions of men as to observe the ordinances of the Lord. Oh, how about that one, Brother Russ? Yeah. We ask concerning every rite and rubric, is, the, is this a law of the God of Jacob? And if it be not clearly so, it is of no authority with us who walk in Christian liberty. So we're not going to be a part of it. Some of the greatest lies that were ever told were mixed with truth. Cunningly devised fables. You know, there's an, I, I don't have time to go into this, um, but there was, Lee sent me an article today uh, on Virginia, there is a Christmas. Have you ever read the original when somebody wrote that to a newspaper, a little girl? wrote that to the, to the newspaper. Lee, do you remember what newspaper that was? Was it the New York Times or what was it? Yeah, in 1897, this little girl wrote and said, is there a Santa Claus? Yes, she asked the dad, yep. Yep. They'll tell you the truth. The father didn't tell her the truth, right? He said, well, this man's a good man, this reporter. He'll tell you the truth. Oh, my goodness. 
That was horrible, wasn't it? Grown man. Yeah. I said, that's not Santa Claus. That's the uniform he's got on. Take the beard off. He's just a regular guy down the street. Anyway, it was, that was scary. But uh, I got that on video, too. Yeah. I get the funnest things on video. But did you? <laughs> well, so she writes in. She calls into this, and she, or she writes into him and asks him, you know, is Santa Claus real? And he goes into this thing where, yes, well, of course he's real, and he's... And, and of course, he's part of, you know, and, and uh, I mean, it, it sounds like he's describing Jesus Christ. And he's talking about the spirit of Santa. And he's talking about all this other things and, and how he goes all over the world and, 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 and how he's real. And, and it's attributing the attributes of God to Santa. Now, Kirk Cameron in his, in his Saving Christmas uh, movie... Uh, stated that St. Nicholas, will, oh man, he's on our side. St. Nick is. Santa Claus is on our side. Really? I don't know who's, well, he's on your side, Kirk. <laughs> he's on your side, Kirk, because I know what side you're on now. Because you just interviewed a, a Roman, a, a Protestant preacher that turned Roman Catholic. And you just interviewed him, and, and he was your defense for St. Nick. So that tells me you're a little plant to get people back to Rome. Because I'm sorry, we don't have the same faith as Rome. If you don't know that, you better start reading this Bible. You better get saved, which you better do. Because you don't know the difference between Roman Catholicism and Christianity. When I first came to Minnesota, though, I, I had Baptists telling me, you know, you shouldn't talk about Roman, you shouldn't really. Because what if Roman Catholic comes in? Well, yeah, what if they do? <laughs> What if they do? <laughs> Good. I hope they do come in. I mean, you, you should you shouldn't say anything like that. You shouldn't do that. And I said, oh, okay, and I did it anyway. But anyway, but Virginia, there is no Santa Claus, even if Kirk Cameron says there is. Okay. He said Saint Nick, and he goes back to Rome, and he does all his dating and everything from that. And he says, hey, you should see Saint Nick. He's on our side. Yeah, he's on Rome's side. You're right. It's not on mine. Amen. Kirk Cameron, he attempted to save Christmas from paganism, but it didn't work. His movie completely flopped, by the way. Like, I mean, Christians didn't even barely go to it. It was like the worst movie of all time on, on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of phony. I mean, I did have some Christians argue with me about it, but it was kind of interesting. Anyway, uh, St. Nick was a Roman Catholic, but people get emotions attached to these traditions. And, and you know, the, the common day Santa Claus is out there, he's the, I mean, Coke invented him, you know. I mean, he's like the, they popularized him, right, Coca-Cola. They, they, they made the red suit and all the fancy stuff. And, I mean, Krampus is the real Santa. But, but uh Anyway, I don't want to scare the children, so we'll keep moving. But and I'm talking about the big ones, not the little ones. But, uh, Lee gets scared really easy when you. Yeah. So I gotta. Anyway, and if you tell someone you you understand that this is a fable, what happens? Because of the traditions, and you try to explain it to them, their emotions are wrapped up into it, and they get very upset. They think that you know you're right. You're condemning them, and you don't love them anymore, and everything. All the Christmas presents and everything else, they meant nothing and everything is just terrible and they, they, they just start crying, you know? Kind of like if you upset ladies and they get upset with you, that's, that's how it goes. And that's who primarily gets upset about this stronger than men do. And it's been my experience with it. I'm going to tell you, like I said, back when I first introduced this, every lady in here had like dagger eyes at me like they you know like if they could throw one at me they 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 would probably want to throw one at me or most of them anyway anyway <laughs> what's that shield of faith was up there for the fiery darts right the helmet of salvation was on i'm telling you you don't know your faces i was looking at all of you okay <laughs> I'm just telling you, everybody, husbands were getting nervous, kind of fidgeting. Oh, man, my wife's going to be mad when we get out of here. I always got a cover for this preacher, man. He always, he always says something to make my wife mad. <laughs> 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 
Russ was thinking he ain't taking my fudge. That's all I got to say. <laughs> I'm still good. No, you know what the first thing Russ said to me after I was done? I walked out there. The first thing he said to me, well, I'm glad I don't have to get you a present, Pastor Cooley. <laughs> First thing he said to me. That's the first thing you said. First, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I think it does. It does. He said, well, I'm glad I don't have to get you nothing now, preacher. I'm not mad at you. You just saved me some money. I can't believe we ordained him. What was wrong with us anyway? He was so mean. The first time he met me, that's the first, what's the first thing he said to me the first time he met me? I didn't know you were such a young punk. <laughs> It's a miracle he was ordained out of here. It's just an absolute miracle, man. I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. He did. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but listen, we're almost done here. <laughs> Ladies can hold on to things longer than others. Their emotions get tied up in them. By the way, I'm not making fun of you that you're a lady. That's the way God made you with emotions. And that's good because, I mean, if you had to walk around, I mean, like... I would never want a lady to be like me, you know, emotionally or anything like that, or be like, you know, like men are, because men are different. I mean, they're, that, that doesn't, that's, not, by the way, it's okay to be emotional. It's okay to have emotions. It's okay. They have to be, you have to put them under the captivity of Christ. So they have to be under control of Christ. But, but that's the way God made you. He made you, because it would be a very bad marriage if you didn't have any emotions at all. And you were like, you know, kind of, if you were like men, it wouldn't be very much fun to be married to you. Amen. Right. It really wouldn't be, right? No, because we need that. We need that soft. I mean, my wife can walk up to me sometimes, and she, all she has to do is just go like this. She doesn't have to say anything. This is like, okay. I can feel it in the next room. <laughs> <laughs> Russ feels it in the next room. <laughs> I've been married longer than you, Pastor Cooley. I can feel it in the next room. <laughs> it appears I have done something wrong. The air is very chilly. What have I done? <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad I helped you. <laughs> oh. But emotions and anger and everything gets worked up. And then and then they become traditions. So then we, we kind of just it gets it I mean it gets bad. So that's what that's what happens, okay? The Bible says though, for laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. We've got to be careful with that, amen. Because this is the real problem. We've laid aside the commandment of God and we hold the traditions of men. We've got to get back to doing... What's the command of God? Teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. That's the command of God. So that's what we get back to. But understand this. You've you got to be kind to those. And you, you got you know your family, you, and you are being kind, but be kind to them. You know, because they don't... They're, they just feel like, you know, as rejected as you are, they feel the same way. They feel like you rejected them. And you didn't. And you're there to love them and everything else, but they feel like they're absolutely... Maybe you'll be able to explain it. Because chances are, most times, they're not going to let you explain it. It's not... It's, I mean, you're just going to be a bad person to them for a while. And... You know, and your pastor's going to be crazy. That crazy guy in Northfield, it's all his fault. That's what you got an email. Yeah. <laughs> well, I have been blamed all over online too, so. It's the way it goes. But anyway, you know what? It's not, I don't tell you what to do. You have to do what the Lord leads you to do. I'll just present the truth to you. I'm not going to back off of it because somebody else isn't comfortable with it. Because, see, I'm the one that has to answer to God and stand before him and say, well, why did you push a lie, preacher? Why, did you, why didn't you propagate the truth? Why did you propagate a lie? The pillar and the ground of the truth. If you ain't finding truth here, you're not going to find it at all. I don't mean here in this pulpit. I mean in the church as an institution. Understand that. I'm not saying me. I'm saying if you don't find it in the church, where, where are you going to find it on earth? Right? If, if the church doesn't tell the truth, then who's going to? A lot of people don't care what the Bible says about this. They're just too upset with it.
They never looked at it. Okay, listen, the Bible says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. We believe that wholeheartedly and preach it. We, we believe it. But, you know, the Bible does say this too in 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. If it's not the truth, I don't want it. It's not honored by God. But many people care more for his birth than his lordship. You know, you're concerned with practicing that, but let me ask you a question. Is, are, you, are, you, are you following Jesus Christ as your Lord? I didn't say are you making him Lord. He is Lord. Are you following him as Lord? He is Lord no matter what. Are you following him as Lord? Are you obeying his commands? Are you observing all things whatsoever he commanded you? Or are you adding to it or taking away from it? We're done here with this, but why does it have so much power? Number one, truth mixed with error is dangerous. Fables added to tradition is dangerous. Pride. Pride. Pride will be the number one reason why you will not receive the love of the truth. You will not receive, the people out there will not. You know what we face every day when you try to tell people the truth out there on that street? I get the same spirit from people when you talk about this Christmas. When you tell them the truth about this, you get the same exact spirit. I mean, basically, you can, like you said, brothers, you can love people for, for years and take care of them every day and do everything else. You have one disagreement about one thing. What is that? It's pride. It's, I don't want to admit that I've been doing this wrong this whole time or that I, that I was duped, I was fooled. Man, I don't like being duped or fooled either. But I'll tell you what, once you get it right with God, you can say, well, I'll, be, I'll help some others so they're not fooled. Or does it make more sense to just stay in my pride and not help anybody and continue on doing things the wrong way? Because that's what we see. I'm telling you, the worst arguments I've ever seen are for Christmas. They're the worst arguments I've ever seen. I mean, they, 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 make, they would make no sense in any other biblical argument that you had or, or debate that you would have. We need to pray for people. Pray for them to see the truth. Amen? Pray for them to see the truth. They need God can reveal it unto them. He may use you to reveal it unto them, but we need to pray for them to, that the Lord would soften their hearts so they could see the truth. They were fooled by the traditions of men, and Christ warned us not to be. People are so proud of their fables and their family traditions that they can't bear to part with them. Not seeing that God will always make fellowship and worship more sweeter if we follow his, his book. If we follow his, you know, seven, eight years ago when we started here, we, we, were, we were kind of just the same as the sending church that we had. And I appreciate them for them sending us out, and I, I'll always be grateful for that. I'll tell you, I will be. I will always be grateful for what they have done and, and the fact that they ordained me and sent me out. Um, because no matter what differences we had, they still did what God had commanded them to do. And, and that deserves respect. So I want you to understand that. I'm not bashing them. But it wasn't until I could look at everything, and I told Brother Russ, and I told Lee, I think it was, some of the men, uh, even before Brother Russ, I think it was just me and you, Lee, and a couple of the other guys and Dad, and I said, you know, we're going to take a look at everything that we're doing here, and we're, we're going to, if it's not, if it doesn't match the scriptures up, then we're not going to do it. And you know what? As soon as we determined to do that, God started sending different. He sent Brother Russ in, and, and, and I was studying things, and he was studying things, and he was studying on the, on the proper order and the family and everything else. And I started looking at that. I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But before that, God had said, no, the first order, you know, if the church isn't ordered correctly, how can you expect families to be ordered correctly? Now, I didn't know any of that. So I looked at the 501c3 issue. I studied it out. I read on it. I went on a Baptist history tour. I looked at all that, and I said, okay, well, this is it. 
I got to do right. So I got to set this in order right. And so then the church was directly under Christ, not under any government entity. Amen. Just like the Constitution, the Bill of Rights affords us in America. Amen? So I looked at it and I was like, okay, well, then we just got to do right. So we all voted and we said, we're going to do right. So all the men got together and we said, we're going to do right. Bam, here comes Brother Russ the next month. The next month. We had just done that. And like the next month, he came in with his family. He said, well, God's called me to preach and to do this. And, and, uh, and I mean, we just want to be able to worship the Lord and have our family together and everything else. I said, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. No big deal there. I mean, all we had was a little nursery with like two kids in there. You know, so it's like, okay, well, that's no big deal. We don't, I mean, we had a little Sunday school with like my kid in there. I was like, well, I don't really care about doing that be honest with you. And then I started studying that. I was like, well, this all makes sense. I was already coming to that decision when Brother Russ was, God was already preparing. And then I studied that order and that, and I was like, well, this is the way we need it. I mean, this is, this is biblical. We need to set this in order. And what happened? God started blessing and he started growing his church. And over the, over the last three years, he's, he's grown his church. And then people were coming. And then Paul said, well, Hey, you know what? I, I'm down here in a 501c3 church. And I was just told basically sit down and shut up boy. And you, you just, this is the way we're Baptists and we know how to do things right. So I don't know what's wrong with you, but this is the best thing going. That's pretty much what was told to him in a nutshell. And then what did he say? He said, well, I'm going to go where they're doing it right. So he came here. Why? Because the order. He saw that the order was under the Lord. He said, okay, I want to do that. I want to be right. I believe that's true. Then, the, the, then, then Brother Russ came with, with because the family because we said, well, man, that's pretty simple. I mean, that's what the Bible says. Let's do it. It wasn't easy at first, but we still followed the Lord, and we obeyed him. And he blessed it. And people started to understand it, and we taught it. And I was like, okay, well, that makes sense. It makes sense that I would take care of my own children. Hey, that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Right? Then other things, then other people started coming, other things started happening. And then Brother Nate and, and everything, and, and God leading him here for different situations and, and through different things and seeing all of those things. But if we never would have stepped out by obedience and faith and said, you know what, I have no problem being the weird one. I have no problem being the one that nobody else, any other church around here may be upset with or don't like the way we're doing it or think we're weird or anything else. That's okay. It really is okay with me. Really, it really is because we're, we need to follow Christ above all else. And if that means that we separate, we don't practice these, these holidays that are not biblical, that aren't lined up with Scripture, that are against Scripture, that are, that are the way of the heathen, then we don't do it. Why? Because we want to be right with God and we want to see the power of God. And I've seen it because none of this, none of this right here makes sense to me as a man. None of it. I didn't push it. I didn't do it with my own work. It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, it wouldn't make sense to anybody. Like, they said, okay, well, as soon as we said no 501c3, we also said, well, we're separate from the sending. We won't be a 501c3. And I said, you know what? The Lord wants me to quit my job. And Lee got nervous, didn't you, Lee? He got nervous. But I said, you know what? God wants me to quit my job. And go full time and get in the ministry and work because he's got something for us to do here. So I'm just going to, I'm, I'm, I, I just, I know that's what God wants me to do. I'm going to do it. So I sold a car that I had that I was making payments on because I didn't want to make any payments. I just sold it. Actually made $1,800 selling it, by the way. It's a pretty good deal. Sold that car and said, okay, this is what the Lord wants me to do. I'm going to do it. Well, that don't make sense. Wait a minute, pastor. Don't you have a salary? No. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I've had pastors call, well, how, do you, how are you doing over there? Listen to me. And this is God's grace. This is not me. This is not because of anything in me. Because I'm not, I don't even plan things, okay? I'm not even that good at it. Like, I make people mad because I don't, okay? I mean, people get mad at me. That's the truth, yeah. They, they, they get, I mean, Russ and Nate and Aaron want to, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's, the, that's I mean, it, it is. Because I, I don't, I don't, I don't do all, I mean, I'm, I don't have all that, that, that stuff. I don't do all that, okay? I don't fill out all those reports and do all those other things. And have all, I don't do any of that stuff. I, I never have done any of that. But what, what did I... And, and people ask me, well, like, how are you doing this? And I know churches have been around five to ten years longer than us. Pastors are working full-time jobs and can't make it financially. 
They've been out there. Their church is not growing, and they can't make it financially. Now, it's not because of anything I've done. The glory goes to God. I didn't do anything. That's what I'm trying to tell everybody. I didn't do it. I'm not making it happen. And it doesn't make sense. When Andrew would tell somebody, somebody asked him, well, I mean, like, how's your pastor making it? You know, how, how are you able to do all this? And, 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 I mean, are you working somewhere? Are you doing this? I mean, not really. I do a little bit on the side, but I don't do much. Why? Because God takes care of it. Why? Because we decided, you know what? Okay, so pastors aren't employees. So, I mean, whatever comes in, we pay the bills. Whatever's left, that's what the Lord provides. And we're not going to get a building to be strapped into mortgages and debts so we can't do anything, so we can't help people. But we pay for brick and mortar. See, then it, may, it makes it easy because you guys don't have anything to fight over. You don't have to fight over the color of carpet. We don't have to have church splits over, over what color the carpet's going to be or what, what you're going to paint this. Or two ladies fighting in the back about something they wanted in the nursery. Because we don't have one of those either. You are the nursery lady. <laughs> they come in, where's the nursery? You're it. <laughs> Amen. You're it. <laughs> you're the nursery. <laughs> Your own nursery. Take care of it. But um, the point is, is that we didn't plan any of that. We didn't do that. All we did was say, okay, fine. If that's what God wants, we'll obey him. We'll follow him. That's what we'll do. What did he do? He blessed it. I can't, it didn't make any sense to me because I took like a $25,000 a year cut. On paper, anyway. I mean, that's the way it went. And I was like, okay, well, that doesn't make any sense. How this is all working out this way. And then God started adding, and he started bringing people in. And then, you know what? We started a radio program, and I didn't ask for a dime from anybody. I started broadcasting down in Texas. I just visited down there and started broadcasting down in Texas. I didn't ask for any money. He said, you want to be a radio host? I was like, I don't Me? I mean, I guess. I mean, yeah, come down here and be on TV with me. So he put me on this local TV station. Those, those shows are on YouTube. You've watched those before. I'm down there. I'm like, okay, this is weird. And then I'm on, and he's like, no, you should do the radio show with me. Then he was like, no, you just take it. Then he was gone for like a year, and I was like, where'd you go? He was like, here, it's your show. And he just left. He just took off. It's like, thanks. We put on sermon audio because you just want to be a blessing to people. We don't charge any money for anything. People send letters and things all over the country. They say, you know what? You're not 501c3. You don't require a salary. You don't ask for all this money. You, never, you, you don't charge for your CDs. There's a lot of big name preachers out there that charge 10, 15, 20 bucks a CD, five, 10 bucks a CD, or whatever, and they, they charge for all their stuff. And I, I'm not, we're not going to charge for any of that stuff. We're going to give it. We're going to give it all away. What do we say when well, we said we're going to give it away? What happened? The very next week we said we we're going to give it away. Somebody sent me in the mail two big uh, eight, eight, uh, seven or eight um, duplicators, CD duplicators. Said, here you go. You need some CDs? And it sent me like 500 CDs. Said, time to get started. Whoa, I wasn't ready. Amen. Amen. Amen? What is that? That's not me doing it. I didn't ask anybody to buy that for us. And then the same week, we get, Brother Aaron gets here, and I, I'm praying to God. I'm like, well, you know, I mean, we need to get him out of there where he's at. We just got to get him out of there. So I'm just going to take the money out of my own account. I'm just going to do it and get it done with because God's going to, God's provided it. Like, I mean, it was just like there and it was all timing. And God was like, yeah, take that 1800 and take care of it. Do whatever you got to do. And then you know what he did? He provided another 1800 to buy all the equipment like two weeks later. And all that equipment was bought and paid for. People would have thought it was crazy. You're going to bring this guy. You don't even know. And you're going to bring him up there, pay for the rent, put it up there? No, the Lord's going to pay for it because I didn't have it. God paid for it. God took care of it. I don't have anything. God does it. All of that under the, under the conditions that we've never asked for that money. We've never asked them. We've never tried to sell it, anything to them. But we just give it, and then people send in money all over the world now. It's because it's got, why? Because we're willing to be the weird ones, that's why. We just believe in obedience. We're not perfect. <laughs> we're not perfect at all. But do you see what, do you understand, are proud of it? That's right, we're not, because we know what we are. I can't do any of this. I can't do any of it. 
But what I can do by God's grace is obey him when he shows me something. I can say, okay, I believe you, God. And even if I don't get it, I'm going to do it. Because you said to. And I'm going to watch you do a miracle. That's exactly what he does. Out of nowhere, it comes. Why? Because we're willing to obey him. And you know what? It's not without a price. People don't like it. They get upset with it. They don't understand why, why, why are you this way and why do you do this? Well, that's why, because I want to obey God. And I'm not perfect, but you know what? I do want to follow him. And I begged God. I said, Lord, just send us men and we'll send them out. So then he sent us Russ. Then we asked for a young one, and he sent us Nate. <laughs> the other one was too old and cranky. I had to get a young one in here. <laughs> I got beat up by the old one. I said, give me a young one here. <laughs> it just, but the Lord blessed, didn't he? And he takes care of his children, and he'll always take care of you if you'll follow him and obey him. No matter where you're at, no matter how hard it is, whether it's New Richmond, Brother Russ, whether it's Texas, wherever it is, it doesn't matter as long as you follow the Lord and you believe in Him and you trust Him for, his, for what He said in His Word and you follow Him, He'll be with you. And He'll give you His power because God blesses obedience. People are twisted with this thing at Christmas. They get upset about it. They're brethren, many of them. They're saved. They need the truth. They won't receive the truth. Some of them get angry. But don't ever stop serving God because somebody else is upset with you. Don't ever back off of the truth because somebody else is upset with you. Don't ever stop. When I came here, God set my face as a flint. He made my, 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 head, my forehead harder than their forehead. And the same way, just to barrel through and do what God wanted me to do. Because only a loud voice will wake them out of their sleep. Father, thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the power of God. Thank you for the moving and the working of God. Thank you for the spirit and thank you for truth. Help us to follow truth, Lord. Thank you for these people, Lord. Lord, thank you that we, we can still share the truth in this country. We can still preach the word of God. And we can try to see lost sinners saved. And we can see the brethren strengthened and edified. Dear God, you've done a work here. Continue to do it, we pray, Lord. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve any of your blessings and any of your gifts, Lord. But upon Christ, we beg you to give them to us and help us that we can take that truth to a lost and dying world with power, Lord. We need your power, Holy Ghost of God. We need your encouragement, Lord. We need your strength. We need your mercy. Dear God, we need you. Help us never to forget how needy we actually are. Help us never forget that all good things come from you, the Father of lights. All good things come from you. Lord, give us wisdom from above that we could do the right thing, that we could say the right thing, that we would have the right attitude, that we would have the right love for, for those that even oppose us, Lord, that we would give them grace and that we would love them even though they oppose us, but stand firm on our convictions. Help us to be lights in a dark, dark world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.